Elizabeth Ann Seton. Born Elizabeth Ann Bailey on August 28, 1774 in New York City, she was born into a wealthy family. Her father was an eminent uh, physician and professor at what is now Columbia University. She was raised uh, as an Episcopalian, uh, well-educated, and even when she was young, she displayed a, a certain uh, generosity and compassion towards the poor. In 1794, at the age of 20, Elizabeth married William Seton, and they had five children together. And the first uh, years of marriage were very happy and prosperous. You know, eventually, though, you know, William, the husband, you know, would, um, would lose his fortune. The business uh, would, uh, would not do very well, and uh, his own health was also um, you know, worsening. And eventually, he had to file for bankruptcy. You know, things got very bad for them, very difficult times, uh, so bad that Elizabeth and William decided to visit uh, good uh, business friends in Livorno, Italy. It was the uh, uh, Felici family. And uh, you know, as soon as um, they landed, you know, William uh, was detained uh, for about a month or so in a cold, uh, quarantined area because of fear of you know, some, uh, some diseases that would, uh, would uh, you know, enter into uh, you know, uh, Italy. And so he uh, survived that, but uh, unfortunately, um, a whole uh, six weeks you know, in Italy, you know, he passed away. Elizabeth remained uh, another six months in Italy, and while there, she was uh, being transformed. You know, she was uh, deeply uh, impressed by the Catholic faith uh, and the charity, you know, especially uh, exhibited by their, their good friends, the Felici family. And by the time she returned to New York City, she was already well on her way as a convinced Catholic. She was especially drawn unsurprisingly, to the Most Holy Eucharist, you know, Jesus' real presence in the Most Blessed Sacrament. How happy we would be, she once wrote to her sister-in-law, if we believed what these dear souls believe, that they possess God in the sacrament, and that he remains in their churches and is carried to them when they are sick. The other day, in a moment of excessive distress, I fell on my knees without thinking when the blessed sacrament passed by and cried in an agony to God to bless me if he was there, that my whole soul desired only him. Elizabeth was also fascinated you know, with Our Lady. She lost her mother when she was very young, and so she was quite drawn to the Catholic belief that Mary could be her mother too. And so during this time period of, you know, of considering becoming Catholic or making that step, you know, it was a very difficult time when, when she came back to the U.S., you know, she turned to our Blessed Mother to guide her you know, to the true faith. And that's what happened. You know, uh, our Lady guided her, and despite the stern opposition from her Episcopalian friends, Elizabeth was baptized a Catholic on March 4th, 1805. She was abandoned by friends and relatives. And in 1808, you know, she um, was invited by the Sulpician Fathers in Baltimore to found a school for girls there. You know, she had a reputation you know, uh, being very gifted with uh, teaching and education. And she did, she did this, and the school prospered. You know, by uh, the next year, the Sulpician Superior, with the approval of Bishop Carroll of Baltimore, gave Elizabeth and a few of her assistants a rule of life. You know, they were uh, to live as uh, religious. You know, they lived uh, according to a rule 
that was adapted from that of the Sisters of Charity founded by St. Vincent de Paul. They began to wear a religious habit and they moved uh, to Emmitsburg, Maryland. They would be the first religious congregation of women with origins in the U.S. They dedicated themselves to the education of Catholic youth and laid the foundation of the American parochial school system, which also, all, they also helped out the poor and orphans. Elizabeth Ann Seton died in Emmitsburg, Maryland on this day, January 4th, in the year 1821. She was beatified by Pope St. John XXIII in 1963 and canonized by Pope St. Paul VI in 1975 to be the first U.S.-born saint. You know, it's, an, it's always inspiring, you know, reading the lives of the saints. And um, it's especially inspiring to read those who's, who's, who lived closer to us in time and perhaps uh, uh, geographically, maybe from the same, same country. You know, all the saints are a great blessing for the whole church and the church holds them up as, uh, as uh, models to follow, you know, for all Catholics, and in particular, and, um, and we are to uh, give them honor and veneration. But in a special way, you know, the saints who are maybe closer to us, you could say, you know, uh, they're very precious for the local church, and, um, and in this case, for the church in the U.S., you know, needless to say, you know, the church needs more saints, always does. And God always raises up saints in every age. You know, the saints that uh, are, are needed, you know, giving to every age, you know, uh, just what they need. You know, saints for the times, you know, such was the case for St. Elizabeth Ann Seton. And, um, and today, you know, the church, you know, needs saints, you know, many saints, you know, to address, you know, all the problems in the church, to help bring about greater healing, you know, in the church, you know, especially in our country, in the U.S. So God's calling, you know, uh, us, you know, to be those saints that the church needs. You know, may each and every one of us respond like uh, St. Elizabeth and all the saints respond to God's call, you know, generously. Praise be Jesus and Mary. Thank you.